Hi students, a very warm welcome to you all to the chemistry sessions. So I hope everybody has revised the chapter which we are going to start today is the chemistry in everyday life that to a questionnaire round for you that I've brought. A set of 10 questions with varying marks, right? Starting with 1, 2, 3 and 4 marks including the value based question as well, right? So let us just try to test our knowledge. Let us have first question. So what do we have? Okay, it says question 1 to 2, 1 mark question. So what is the cause of the feeling of depression in human beings, right? I must have told you this in the session. Name a drug which can be useful in treating the depression. So basically, what kind of a drug, what kind of a hormone is released in our body which causes, which uplifts our mood, what is that? No, not, I am not talking about the serotonin, no. It's a neurotransmitter that I'm talking about. So that is noradrenaline. Yes. And this particular horm hormone, we can say hormone, but specifically it is neurotransmitter. And this neurotransmitter, if released in proper amounts, it will regulate our mood. It is regulating our mood. And if it's not released in proper amounts, we get depression. So basically neurotransmitter is, it's transmitting the signals. So that signal transmission process, it becomes really slow and we feel, we have the feeling of depression, we feel very sad, right? So that is the only reason this particular hormone, right? This particular neurotransmitter. And now which drug can be used in treating the depression? Can you tell me any kind of a drug? So it is, yeah. One of the drugs is phenylzine. Phenylzine, also known as Nardil. Yes. So it is basically an antidepressant drug. And yeah, what is the structure for that? So that is what phenylzine is. Another one, Ipronia Z, right? That is also an antidepressant. So we have discussed a lot of antidepressants over here. You can name any one. Fine. Done. Let's move on further. Let me just rub this. Okay. So what do we have in the next question? So the next question says, what is tincture of iodine and what is it used for? So you know what tincture of iodine is? I told you. The iodine products are used as antiseptics. So basically tincture of iodine is an antiseptic. It is used in the wounds, right? Treating the wounds and especially whenever there are post-operative procedures. In post-surgical procedures also the wounds are treated with this tincture of iodine. And yes, what composition it has? It's 2 to 3 percent of iodine solution with, along with what? Yes, although, uh, yes, uh, it's a solution. So I'll be having water. Yes. Along with what? Along with alcohol. Yes. So that completes the entire solution of tincture of iodine. Clear? Now let's move to the next question. What do we have in the next question? Yeah. So it's a two mark question, three to six basically. Define the following. First is the limited spectrum antibiotics. Second, the tranquilizers. So limited spectrum antibiotics. First of all, what are antibiotics? Which kill the microbial growth or which may be bacteriostatic also. What is bacteriostatic? Which can stop the growth of the microorganisms. Fine. So I've got uh, different, different antibiotics in this. I have got two categories. One is limited spectrum right another is the broad spectrum so even if you are having confusion in what limited spectrum is you can just think about the bro broad spectrum fine then you can get an idea that broad will be covering a broad range of as many number of microorganisms as possible that means covering an entire range of microorganisms which upon which it can work Whereas if I talk about the limited spectrum antibiotics, 
So it is specified for only one or two, maximum two microorganisms. So specified for only one microorganisms, right? Microorganism. Yeah. Again, I'm not going into the detail of the definition. So what can be a possible example of limited spectrum? So the example is penicillin. Right? Clear? And specifically penicillin G. Right? Tranquilizers. What is tranquilizers? We have just discussed this. Antidepressant drugs all are included under the category of tranquilizers. So tranquilizers are basically stress relievers. If we have got anxiety, if there is sudden depression, right? All of these things are uplifted by tranquilizers. So basically tranquilizers are stress and anxiety reliever, right? Also, what it does is, it also treats the mental diseases, fine. It also treats the mental diseases. And in fact, it's a very key component in the sleeping pills also. So we have just revised the entire definition of the tranquilizers here. And what kind of a tranquilizer can you name? Again, we can name phenylzine, we can name ipriyonazid. In fact, all the class of barbiturates that we might have discussed, yes, we have discussed many of them, right? Equanil, again an antidepressant. So these are different, different tranquilizers. Clear? Okay. So let's move on further to the very next question. What do we have? Question number four. Explain the following terms, giving an example of each. Antacids. So what is antacid? Whenever there is overproduction of acid in my stomach, in order to treat that irritation, in order to treat that burning sensation, we have got antacids. Antacids, which when we consume, will decrease the amount of acid production. Fine. So in that case, I have got is, let's say, yeah, ranitidine. It's a revolutionary, a revolutionary one, right? Also known as Zantac. And we have discussed one more, Cimetidine. In the earlier times, not these medicines were used, but simply milk of magnesia, MGOH hold wise. So such basic oxides were also used. Some basic compounds were also used in order to neutralize the acid which is present in the stomach. Right? Done. Sweetening agents. These are the artificial sweeteners basically which are available in the market. These are the chemicals which can replace the sucrose. Right? And why they are better? They are better because they have no calories. And they also don't affect the blood sugar levels as the sucrose does, right? As the regular sugar does. So that is what the quality of the sweetening agents are. Can be used in different, different products, different, different uh, bakery products, different cooking, uh, cooking procedures. These sweetening agents are also used. In fact, these sweetening agents, some sugar capsules are also available, like uh, sweetening capsules are also available by the name of sugar free they are available in the market these are also sweetening agents so in any kind of food material in any kind of drink they can be used right depending upon the type of sweetening agent so any example for this yes we can have aspartame which is the most popular one it's the saccharine we have got sucralose we have got elitame and so many right so I hope everybody has got this. So these are very basic, you know, general definitions which have been asked in the exam. And yes, you need to remember the example for the, each one of it, right? So now, uh, now let's move on to the very next question. What do we have? Okay, it's a very interesting question basically. Label the hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts in the following molecule of a non-ionic detergent. So first of all, this question has directly been picked from the NCRT. Right? I wanted to add this question because again it's a kind of a typical question which requires a little trickiness, right? Not just a regular concept but out of the box thinking. A little. See here. So what they have given is non-ionic detergent, right? 
So we have done is cationic, we have done is anionic detergents and also the non-ionic. So they have given one non-ionic random detergent over here. So they want us to find out the functional groups present in the molecule first of all. Yeah, and to label hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. Now what is phobic? That means having phobia with the water, right? Repelling the water. What will it be? Will it be having oxygens? Because oxygen and hydrogens kind of hydrogen bond with the water. So this will be bonding with the water, this part, right? And whereas this part, if you observe, this is what? It's a hydrophobic part, completely a hydrocarbon, right? So this will be the phobic. I'm just writing this in short. And here, this very part will be philic. Clear? Clear about the terms that what is hydrophobic and what is hydrophilic? Now comes up, yeah, the functional groups present in the molecule. See here, one of them is OH. Another, what is it? It's ether, right? O and then CH2, CH2O and up to X. So many units will be present of it. Fine. So thereby, it's ether linkage and nothing else. Clear about it? So yes, that completes my question number five as well. I hope that is clear to you. And yeah, let's move on further. Question number six, what do we have in question number six? Now it says, explain the following terms with suitable examples. Yeah, now comes up the type of detergents, cationic and anionic. So cationic means the cationic part should be the bigger one. Anionic means the anion part should be the bigger one. Fine. But the usages of both of them are completely different. Fine. In cationic, what do I have is C. This is the entire compound which I am drawing and from here will be again deducing the definition of it. Positive, Br, negative. So what is this? Cetyl. You call this part as cetyl, trimethyl, three methyls are there, <coughs> ammonium, bromide, yes? So that is what the cationic detergent is and the cation part is the bigger one. So basically what the definition says is, the definition is it's a ammonium salt, right? Ammonium salt and the counter ion should, can be bromides, can be acetates, can be chlorides and so on so. Right? So that is what a cationic detergent is. Clear about it? And yes, what, what kind of a use it has? So it has got germicidal properties. Its germicidal properties makes it perfect for what? To be added in some expensive cosmetic products, especially in hair conditioners. Right? Clear? Cationic done. Now comes up the anionic. So anionic, what are those? In anionic, I have got the long chain alcohols, right? So it is anionic uh, detergents are basically sodium salts of long chain alcohols or hydrocarbons, right? So what is it? See here. If I take up laurel alcohol, so this is laurel alcohol, I want to make it the sodium salt, yeah, sodium salt of, sodium salt of long chain alcohols which are sulfonated basically. This is most important thing, sulfonated. I need to first sulfonate it by adding H2SO4, right? So it will be SO3, negative will be formed. Fine. And then SO3H, right? Sulfonic acid will be formed. We know this. I'm not going to complete it. And after the sulfonic acid, after this group, if I treat it with NaOH, we get SO3 negative Na positive, And that is what my anionic detergent is. Most of them are used in the household works, right? Clear? So let's move on further with the question number seven, what I have got here. Yeah, so question number 7 to 9, 3 marks. Questions I've got, define antihistamine with an example. So, 
I have a cat at my home, right? And whenever I go nearby to that cat, I start sneezing so much because I have got allergy, right? And this allergy which is produced in my body is due to the release of one chemical. What is that chemical known as? That is known as histamine, right? So whenever there is overproduction of this chemical histamine, we get allergies from so many things. It can be dust, it can be very little things, right? Some very unknown causes can be there for these allergies and which are very troublesome. So for that, we have designed histam antihistamines so that we break the uh, receptor and the histamine connection. We know how the receptor, the binding sites of the receptor are working towards the histamine which is getting connected to the receptor. So it breaks this antihistamine, it breaks that connection and that is how it again prevents the overproduction of histamine in the body and that is what an antihistamine is clear an example bromphenyramine that is an antihistamine clear now next one which one of the following drugs is an antibiotic so i have got morphine equonil chloramphenicol and aspirin see here morphine it's a drug yeah, that kind of a drug, yes, the one you are thinking, it's a narcotic, yes, it's a narcotic analgesic painkiller, so it's not included in the antibiotic, equonil, it's a tranquilizer, I just told you, right, not included, chloramphenicol, yes, that is the answer, that is the antibiotic, and in fact, it is the bacteriostatic antibiotic. What about aspirin? Aspirin is again a painkiller. Analgesic, non-narcotic analgesic. Clear? So that completes part number two. Next. Why is the use of aspartame limited to cold foods and drinks? Why is that so? I have discussed this as well. So basically, aspartame at higher temperatures, it decomposes. So that is why at higher temperatures, it cannot be used because it's of no use. It gets decomposed completely. So that is why it's only added in cold foods and drinks. It cannot be used in baking. It cannot be used in cooking, which requires heat. Clear? Now that completes question number seven as well. <clears throat> Let's move on to the very next question. What do we have? Okay. What class of drugs is ranitidine? We just have discussed. It's antacid. If water contains dissolved calcium ions, out of soaps and synthetic detergents, which will you use for cleaning clothes? So, do you uh, clean clothes with soaps? No? It is always the detergent which you use. Why? Because we have got, usually, we have got hard water, right? And hard water contains calcium, in fact, magnesium ions. So, these calcium and magnesium ions, they interact with the soap if we use to form a scum, right? To form some precipitate, some frothy material, which is, see here, so these are calcium ions, which actually interact with the soap, like, and yeah, NaCl can be produced, or maybe if I talk about Mg plus 2, I'm not writing the entire reaction, I'm not spoon feeding you, you have to do it on your own. What you get is, <coughs> maybe let's say MgSO4, fine or in fact MgCl2 is also produced. So such non-soluble items are produced, non-soluble chemicals or compounds are produced due to which now the froth is not being made and it's of no use now, right? No froth, no cleaning. So that is why synthetic detergents have replaced the soaps for cleaning the clothes, right? Because in synthetic detergents, it doesn't matter whether we are taking soft water or hard water, it is going to work, it is going to make froth, right? It is going to clean the cloth. Clear? Done? Next one, which of the following is an antiseptic? So antiseptic is used on a living tissue. For my skin, I need a milder one, not a strong one. So out of the two, which one is mild? The one having less of concentration. So that is what an antiseptic is. Whereas 1% phenol is used as a disinfectant, right? On the non-living things, maybe on a floor for mopping or something. Clear? 
<coughs> so, eighth question done. Let us move on further to the question number ninth. Okay. Mention the action of the following on the human body in bringing relief from a disease. Now, bromphenyramine, we already have discussed this. What is this? It is an antihistamine. <coughs> And we have already discussed the action of antihistamine. I am not repeating that. Aspirin, it is a painkiller. Yeah. It is a painkiller, but regular use of aspirin and more use of aspirin, it can lead to liver damage, right? So, instead of that, what you uh, what can be a replacement of aspirin? So, aspirin is basically uh, a painkiller, it is also an antipyretic, that means fever reducing right it has got those prop properties as well so basically instead of aspirin what a better analgesic you can use is ibuprofen right ibuprofen is a little less toxic equanil i have already told you about this equanil is a tranquilizer right so it's uh, it reduces the depression it reduces the hyper anxiety right hypertension fine so we already have discussed these three as well clear so ninth question also done now let us take up the very last question and yeah it is a value based question four mark question due to the hectic and busy schedule Mr. Singh started taking junk food in the lunch break and slowly became habitual of eating food irregularly to excel in his field so he started taking so much of junk food one day during the meeting he felt severe chest pain and fell down what was that all about? It was all about the acidity, right? Mr. Kanna, a close friend of Mr. Singh, found out that he was suffering from acidity and thereby prescribed him some medicines. Mr. Kanna advised him to eat homemade food, healthy lifestyle should be there, yoga, meditation, physical exercises. Mr. Singh followed his friend's advice and after a few days he started feeling better, right? So now on the basis of this paragraph, let's just try to answer the questions. What do we have here? Yeah. What are the values, at least two you have to display by Mr. Khanna? So first of all, Mr. Khanna was concerned for his friend, right? He was a concerned person. Concerned person, right? He was helping. He had got a very helpful nature. And yes, he was aware of the fact that the junk food can be very severe in many of the cases, right? So junk food, it, uh, it, he knew the disadvantages of having the junk food and not the healthy food and healthy lifestyle, right? So he was aware of the benefits of healthy food <clears throat> and lifestyle, yes? So these are at least two you can pick from here. Now, what are antacids? Already done. Give one example. Already done. Ranitidine, simitidine, so many. Third one. Would, you, uh, would it be advisable to take antacids for a long period of time? Give reason. Now, if I am taking again and again, like if I had a meal, again I took an antacid after that, antacid. So, regularly taking antacids can be fatal for you. Why? Because it can completely stop the production of acid in your stomach, right? And if the production of acid in your stomach is stopped, what will happen? Entire digestive process, entire metabolic process will be affected and will directly affect your kidneys. It can damage entirely your kidneys, it can damage your metabolic process, it can damage your digestive tract, right? And that is why it is not advisable, not only just antacids, but any kind of an antibiotic, any kind of a drug to take it in huge amounts. So that is why they say that always go to the doctor for a prescription. Because anyhow, you won't be knowing that how much quantity you need for a particular disease or for, for a particular illness you are suffering from. Clear? And yes, that completes the 10th question as well. I hope everybody has got it. You have to again revise the entire session. And if you have got any doubts, you can always ask me. I'll be available for you. Have a nice day.